The new season is a new occasion for interesting meetings, incredible discoveries, and curious stories. My name is Konstantin Koksin. I'm an ethnographer, Turkologist, traveler, full member of the Russian Geographical Society, director of the Museum of Nomadic Culture in Moscow. My name is Tinkai Kritova. I live in Kazakhstan. I study the history and culture of the Great Steppe. The culture of nomads of the Great Steppe is my favorite topic, which I have been researching for many years, and I have something to tell about it. I think that we will hear many new and unexpected facts from you. Welcome to Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan. Culture is a second nature. Everything that a human hand touched only once belongs to culture. Nomads did not build cities, did not dig canals, did not destroy mountains. Therefore, Europeans and Chinese considered them wild and backward. But culture is not measured by the height of the constructed walls, the thickness of the written books, the depth and the length of the dug channels. Culture is a reflection of the soul of people. Over the thousands of years of its history, the nomads of the Great Steppe had created one of the most striking cultures in the history of mankind. How is the greatness of culture measured? Maybe by the capacity of its symbols? By the meaning of its symbols. Suppose I draw a wall and a hieroglyph next to it. China. That's right. A tall tower with dome and crescent. Arab world, Arab Muslim world, a headdress with feathers, Indians. Mm -hmm. The Indians of North America, I will show you the ornament of the carpet or on the bowl that I hold in my hands, and you will say, nomads of the steppe. If a culture is recognized by all the people of the world due to individual symbols and individual elements, then this is a great culture. This is a culture's contribution to humanity, and the nomads made a significant contribution. И кочевники внесли весомый вклад. Самые древние памятники на территории the most ancient monuments on the territory of the Great Steppe are cave paintings. I know that you have been to these shrines. Tell me which one you remember the most because Kazakhstan abounds in them. Indeed, we have a lot of petroglyphs, and I know that in old times young men and even young girls came there. And there, people were waiting for them to give them knowledge and carry out a kind of initiation. Petroglyphs are not just drawings, they are a whole story, they are a description of the cosmos and the world around us. Terekti Aulie in Ulitao, in central Kazakhstan. People still come to these places for treatment because they feel unprecedented power there. Surely, not all petroglyphs were called places. What do you think? How did the first petroglyphs appear? I've been thinking about it for a very long time. Do you want me to answer? Sure. In the city, boys and girls take spray cans the paint on the walls. 
This is embedded in us by the Creator, nature, sky, to leave our mark, at least to scratch, I've been here. And only later, gradually, petroglyphs began to bear a deep symbolic magical meaning, sometimes of initiation. When I worked in Australia, I saw sacred caves, a female cave, a male cave, and a children's cave, a school where children were taught how to draw petroglyphs correctly. If the aborigin draws something wrong, the world will not be recreated and it will all collapse. For them, this is very serious, and earlier, they could be executed for a mistake. Wow, you know, in our territory, the culture of depicting images on rocks has existed since ancient times and has survived until the 20th century. What amazes you most in ancient petroglyphs? To be honest, it surprises me that the more ancient the petroglyph is, the more skillfully it is depicted. Because people were closer to nature. You know, he sees a running deer and literally, by three strokes, he conveys this grace, this movement, this swiftness. Subsequently, petroglyphs became more and more like a picture, more complicated. There appeared some kind of mystical signs which emerged during a trance. But my favorite ochre petroglyphs and cave paintings are swiftly flying animals. Mm. Such a proximity to nature can only be felt by a person who does not distinguish himself like the ancient nomads. These fast-moving animals, deer with their heads thrown back, leopards throwing themselves at them from the grass, later developed into the legendary animal style of the Scythians, the Huns. Interestingly, I saw petroglyphs in different parts of the Great Steppe, and everywhere the proportions are roughly preserved when depicting the same Argali. It seems like a single master trained absolutely all nomads. It is surprising that the finds made by our exhibition in Mongolia, for example, and the finds of Scythian burial mounds in the Black Sea seem to be made by one person, although the times are different. They were different peoples, speaking different languages, but this culture unites them. That is why we have the right to talk about the culture of the Great Steppe. The Great Steppe, both words with a capital letter, because the Scythians, Sacks, Huns, Turks, worked in the same style. Moreover, their descendants, for example, contemporary Buryat artists, work in the same animal style. It is recognized in these paintings and statues. The direction of the noses of animals in the images is the direction of the migration of people. But recently, I've already heard a version that if an animal is depicted to the right, then it is a living animal. If it looks to the left, then it is dead. There are some stones where all animals are depicted normally, and there is one that is image lying on its back. Then, this is a specially killed or sacrificed animal. Did you see petroglyphs where the viscera are depicted? We have images of a bull, or rather a cow, inside which there is a calf. They depicted ribs, liver, kidneys. There are different versions, saying that these are sacred meanings of planets, stars, but most likely, you know how it was. They drew animals to throw spears at them before hunting, such hunting magic. They were terribly hungry, those hunters. They drew because they were craving, for example, for kidneys, liver, or briskets. That is probably what happened, because even now, there are peoples who live as hunters-gatherers. Even in the 21st century, they draw before hunting. That is, they divide the outline of the animal into parts, stick spears, and then hunt for it. Mm -hmm. I think it is called imitative magic, isn't it? Yes, that is, we depict what we get here, then it will work out there. By the way, the same was harmful magic. They portrayed the enemy, stuck needles into him, like the cult of voodoo. For me, as for a Kazakhstani, the closest, the most sacred symbol is a sun-headed man. But I know that these are found all over the planet. In the north, I saw an image of a man with a head shaped as a fly agaric. The fly agaric was a military mushroom before a battle. In the north, they drank a decoction of fly agaric, and they were not afraid of anything after that. But the sun heads, how do they explain the symbol? Most likely, it is associated with Tingrianism. The sky is a symbol of Tingri, as well as the sun is a symbol of Tingri. 
But why does a man's head become huge with dots and start to shine? By the way, I noticed that there are usually nine dots. If we talk about the magic of numbers, all the people of the earth, almost all, worship three. These are the three worlds, lower, middle, upper. Lower, middle, upper in all religions are our world, paradise and hell. In Buddhism, Trilokya, three locations, all the same. But perhaps it dates back to ancient concepts. In the nomadic steppes, the hearth of a triangle shape is three generations living around the same fire. Perhaps the worship of three dates back to this archaic concept. Because when we are two, we are not yet a family, but when a child appears, it is a family, a continuation of the clan. The number seven is also honored. Well, everyone loves seven, right? Those who play cards believe that seven is a lucky number. These are seven planets, including the sun and moon. People in ancient times were not fools. They watched the stars. They had nothing to do. They observed the stars. All the stars are motionless, and some rotate. They were planets. They were clearly visible. Well, including the sun and the moon, there are seven planets. All this appeared in Sumer which is why we have a week of seven days. I know another version of why the number seven is sacred. This is a combination of three worlds and four corners of the world, or the four main solar points of the year. By the way, the Indians of North America say the same thing, four sides and three worlds. Actually, the Indians of North America revere the number four, four directions of the cardinal points, the direction up to the sky, down to the earth, and the main direction, inward yourself. Well, seven sacred directions and four earthly directions give the main Indian number 28. A teepee of a North American shaman has 28 poles. Nine, the most revered number among the Mongols, among the Turkic peoples, is three times three. Three of the lower, three of the middle, three of the upper world. Nine white wedding gifts, nine white horses, nine white camels. When a boy turned nine, the Mongols in ancient times were looking for a bride for him. Yesintuk, which means nine banners in Mongolian, was always established at the headquarters of the Han. By the way, here comes the name of the city, Yesintuki. But there was the residence of the Han. Not only Tumien comes from the Mongolian Tumien, but Yesintuki means nine banners as well. Look how the ancient symbols of the nomads intertwined in modern culture. One of the most striking symbols of the nomadic world is a yurt. Well, we will draw a yurt, let's say a squat Mongolian one. It will be a Mongolian symbol, a little higher, a rounder Kazakh one with intersecting ribbons. This will be a symbol of Kazakhstan, but the most recognizable symbol inside the yurt is Shanirak. I see that you have earrings in the form of the sacred sign. After all, the jewelry art of nomads is also a reflection of the world around and, of course, amulets. In Kazakh jewelry, symbols are often used, which is designed to either tell something or protect the owner from something. Do you remember, we were told in the museum that when a girl wears a ring with such an image, conventionally called the beak, if the triangle is directed inward to the hand, then the girl is engaged. If it is directed out, then she is single. Ziyad Satinbek, Yuvelir, Antiquar, Ziyad Satinbek is a jeweler and antique dealer. Which ring does a married woman wear? If I get married, the daughter-in-law enters the house. My mother puts an otau juzik on the daughter-in-law's finger. This is a wedding ring. Here, the symbol is like a hearth. This is a house. This is a shanirak. This is a wedding ring, and its symbol is a hearth, a home, or a shanirak. And here are four sides of the world in one circle. There are also very big rings that are worn on two fingers. It is called Kudari Juzik, a two-finger ring. When the married girl's mother received the bird's beak ring, meaning that her daughter is happy and grateful to her mother.
She makes such a ring as a sign of her gratitude to her co-parents-in-law. This is called a co-mother-in-law's ring. Wow, it turns out that it is symbolism, that the life of two young people is enclosed in a circle. And I also see little grains here. It turns out that life will be rich and successful. One of the oldest symbols of humanity, for example, is a symbol of the Indians of North America, which is a cross inscribed in a circle. And there are four colors. When the Lakota Indians raised their last revolt in the 70s, the Great Eagle was one of the leaders. They proclaimed the Republic of Lakota and proclaimed that they would exit from the United States. And the emblem of the Republic of the Indians, not recognized anywhere else in the world, was this solar sign, a cross in a circle and four colors. Black yellow, red, and white. We also see the symbol among the nomads of the steppe. In general, the connection between the Indians of the prairies and the nomads of the Kazakh and Mongolian steppes is obvious. Every culture originates from nature. I'm not talking about the culture of nomads. It is generally associated with this world. Nomads are considered part of the universe. To destroy, to break something in nature was blasphemy, a violation, a taboo. Heaven punished man for that. But the traditional rural and urban culture fits organically into the surrounding landscape. For example, we were in South Kazakhstan. Remember the clay cities? or classical Armenian and Georgian temples. Central Russia, or Siberia, is completely different. Mossy logs and crevices, the right behind the house, there is a woods from which this house was built. Ancient architects beautifully fitted dwellings in a landscape, but traditional cultures go to the era of recent globalization. Everything in the world is made of metal and plastics, and humanity challenges nature. It will not lead to anything good. By the way, the nomads of the steppe have already been associated with China. Do you think the Chinese love nature, defied it, or destroyed it? Well, since the Chinese gave the name Tian Shan as a heavenly mountains, I think they also also had a close connection to nature. Sure, they admired the world around them, but according to Chinese tradition, nature that has not been changed by a human is absolutely not beautiful. Strongly modified, it is even worse. A man should, having thought and prepared very well, introduce a light touch into nature. It's like our cameraman before the filming. Here, they stamped a bit of grass flat, raised it here. The grass remained grass, but in the frame, it will look better than it was when we just arrived. It is a Chinese model. Remember, Chinese painting, nature, mountains, a waterfall, and a small gazebo, or a boat imperceptibly tied to bamboo. <laughs> Neatly arranged pebbles. Yes. <laughs> Nomads erected religious buildings that did not stand out much from nature. For a nomad, any place that stood out from the landscape was sacred. A single tree, right? A hill. Mm -hmm. All this became sacred and deified. The Turks had a very beautiful tradition to tie ribbons to the branches of trees. But nowadays, unfortunately, people tie everything that comes to their hand, shoelaces, synthetic colored ribbons, and even worse, they tie them with a fixing knot. A branch cannot grow, the tree suffocates and dies. Initially, they tied a ribbon cut off from their own clothes to a branch of sacred tree, and often just to dry trees or to poles that were no longer alive. Their clothes were made of cotton, natural, not synthetic, like it is now. And this cotton ribbon is the open air, in the sun, would perish in a year. Moreover, it was believed that when it decays, the prayers will reach heaven. 
As a nomad said, it doesn't matter what you leave on the pass or in a holy place, even the hair out of the horse's mane, but you must do it from a pure heart. A nomad saw the world around him and, like any other person, tried to display it in art. And one of the most striking manifestations of the art of the nomad of the steppe is, of course, an ornament. There is another symbol of Kazakhstan and neighboring Kyrgyzstan as well, which is recognized immediately by all people in the world. We are sitting on a carpet a la Kuz, which is covered with ornaments. This is not a very old work. What colors, what paints, what lines? These are not just drawings. Each sign means something. There is a version that the carpets were the writing of nomads. Ornaments were applied for a reason. There are images on which no one can step. Therefore, they are depicted on carpets that are hung on the walls, while others are applied only to clothing. Some, like a talisman, were placed on the backs to protect them from evil spirits, so to speak, from damage. There is an ornament, Kastaban. It is translated as a goose footprint. It looks like two birds, two swans, which touch each other with the beaks. It is always drawn as a mirror. If a woman in labor cannot give birth, this pattern is applied to somewhere on the hem of her dress, and childbirth goes easy. Ornament is always a magical sign. Birds touching each other with their beaks is the main ornament of the shamans of the Apache, the Indians of South America. Two birds that touch their beaks symbolize a great balance. When light and darkness, good and evil are in balance and the world exists normally. Colored ornaments have additional somatic meaning. Nomads have five primary colors. I will tell you about the Mongolian semantics of color, and you will tell me about the Kazakh. We will compare them. The white color is the most revered one among nomads, generally the entire steppe. It is holiness of holiness, purity, the color that unites the entire universe. For us, it is also the color of milk, mother's milk, and the milk with which mother Umay feeds newborn babies. Sagan is the same. It is white in Mongolian. Sagan ide is white food, sacred food. Seeing off a man, they sprinkle a trace of milk, kumus. Agjol, the Kazakhs say. Sagan zam, говорят у монголов, одно и то же. Дальше черный цвет. Saganzan, the Mongols say the same. Next is black. Black does not have a negative meaning in the Mongolian culture. Black is the antipode to white, but it is also clean and clear. Like Yerli Khan is the antipode of Tingri. They are both needed. These are two poles of the world, dualism. Har Ayrik, black kumis, was a Han's drink. A story is known when this drink was offered to a Russian prince, and the translator said, Prince, they poured black kumis, but two wants to poison you. The prince poured the drink out in horror, and they chopped his head off, because black kumis was an elite drink obtained from the milk of young black mares. The Han wanted to show his respect, and the prince didn't understand. Learn ethnography, that's what I'm telling Учите этнографию. Вот к чему рассказываю. For us, black is also not so negative. Rather, it shows the intensity, power of a phenomenon. For example, even in names. Karamirgin is a black hunter, literally. This is a very strong, outstanding hunter. Well, or a boy with this name will be happy and talented. The red color is revered in Kazakhstan. Yes, in Kazakh ornaments, red color is found too. Many clans are fond of using red in their coat of arms, the symbol, because it symbolizes wealth and valor. Он символизирует богатство и доблесть. Зеленый, зеленый с синими оттенками этот цвет. Green with a blue tint is a color of grass and earth, which gives life, therefore it is a female color. Very often, women, mothers, wear green robes as a sign that they are connected with the earth, with this green step that gives birth, and they give birth to children. And finally, yellow is the color of the sun, but in modern Mongolian culture, it is the color of Buddhism. Buddhist monks wear yellow robes, so a simple person, not a monk, does not have the right to wear yellow robes. What is the meaning of yellow among the Kazakhs? It is the sun, heat and gold. There is another important color for all nomads, blue. 
The Mongols called themselves proudly the Blue Mongols, like the ancient Turks called themselves. Kokturk, the color of the sky, is everything. Buddhism has come to terms with this. Hadag, a blue scarf, is a symbol of Mongolian culture. Blue color, and if you add the golden sun to it, this is a flag under which you can unite the entire planet. After all, the solar symbol is found on absolutely all continents. I will say this like a patriot, but the flag of Kazakhstan, which depicts a golden sun against a blue sky, is truly international. Eagle, the harbinger of Tingri. I think if we unite nations, then we should do it under the blue manner. By the way, the UN has also a blue emblem. Heavenly Turks called themselves Kok Turk. After all, they have Kok Boru, the guard, right? The symbol of Kagans appointed by Tengri. This is a war drum. The Kazakh name is Dalpas. And what significance does it have for the Tengrians? This is Mangilik, eternity, right? For the Mongols, it is also a step road with no beginning and no end, such a Mobius strip. And a turtle, right? Turtle is a symbol of sustainability, the foundation of everything. By the way, this is one of the eight symbols of sacred Buddhism, a symbol of the road. And there, Jolbaris, tiger. Tiger. Mm -hmm. Such a powerful symbolism tool. They are symbols of Tengrianism on this tambourine, such as a double-headed eagle and a snake. Well, I can assume there is a tree and a snake that swallows an egg that the bird Rook had laid. Very beautiful. This is Iranian mythology. Everything is intertwined here. Why does the bird have two heads? When a person dies, one of these birds takes his soul to heaven, to Tengri. When the soul is reborn, it is brought back to life by the other bird. Two heads, this is what returns and takes at the same time, a symbol of rebirth and unity in general. It is a symbol of balance. In Tengrianism, the two-headed bird also ensures that all spirits and all gods fulfill their missions. And here is a swan and a solar sign, a swastika. It is a solar sign in many cultures. It goes clockwise. Interestingly, among the Indians of North America, their main sign is a sign of Wakantanka. Wakantanka is like Tingri. The same thing, but this is a circle and a cross inside, and four colors of four sides, among the Indians of South America. The swastika is twisted in the opposite direction. Why? It turned out that in the southern hemisphere, the sun is moving in the other direction. When I saw it for the first time, I was astonished. The sun rises and goes like this in the sky. No way! The melodies sound well together. Nomads are people who are always on the move. Herds are moving. Horsemen are also moving to drive the sheep and goats. A sunbeam moves along the walls of a yurt when light falls through a shanirak. The wheel of time moves, epochs are changing, but art is what unites the Huns, the Turks and modern nomads. When we choose things that we will use in everyday life, a refrigerator, a car, we choose according to technical characteristics. When we choose art objects, there is only one criterion. If we like it or not, this line of continuity, which begins in ancient times when the first inhabitants of the steppe created art, 
was never interrupted. When modern Kazakhs and Mongols look at the ancient plaques made by the Huns or Turks in the museum, they admire them. And modern artists are trying to reproduce this art. This is a single culture, an ancient beautiful culture of the Great Steppe. Это единая культура, древняя, красивая культура великой степи.